Good morning. How are you doing? It's good to see you. A <laughs> uh, couple of little kind of housekeeping things before I begin this morning. Uh, I'm uh, Kendra and I are going on a on a vacation. We leave Wednesday morning, and while we're gone, um, actually we're celebrating 40 years of being together. So, 40 years of marriage. Um, I jokingly sometimes say 27 of them have been pretty good, you know. So um, if there was ever an off year, it's on me. I just want you to know that as well. I say that, uh, I want you to know that I am so looking forward to holding Kendra's hand for three weeks and to walk around, look at beautiful things, eat some good food, but to be with Kendra. The final week, Grant Nakoda will be joining us. So we'll be uh, in Spain somewhere, um, and Kendra's got the itinerary all planned, and so and I'm expecting a maybe just a little baby bump, and so we're excited about that. Uh, while I'm gone, I'm also going to be uh, celebrating 60 years of living. So it's kind of a Kendra has a has a little bit of a she's someplace she wants to take me out to dinner and stuff. It'll be a lot of fun. So I want you to know that we're going to be gone for a couple of weeks. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to continue as a church family through the book of Ephesians. So we've been walking through the book of Ephesians. You'll hear from Michael, you'll hear from uh, Andrew, and you'll hear from Scott. And so this will just continue to go forward. Um, it's, today is a little bit of a summary of where this has been. Um, and so uh, I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, I want to begin by just kind of giving you a frame to hang today's talk on. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, being very careful about how you live. Uh, watch your step is what Paul says. And then secondly, I, I want to talk about what it means to walk in the Spirit. Or what does it mean to walk in the Holy Spirit? Watch your step. Be careful. Be wise. Second thing is walk in the Spirit. And then from there, uh, Paul talks about three, I want to say, gauges that you and I can kind of use to say, am I... Am I, how's my life going? Am I keeping step with the Spirit? That kind of a thing. If you're just stepping into this series, I want you to know a whole lot of water has gone under the bridge, and I will do my best to try to summarize those things because we're in a summary spot in, in, the, uh, in the text. Uh, number one, Paul says, watch your step. Be careful how you live. Uh, verse uh, number 15 out of chapter 5 says this. Here's Paul. It's kind of a summary. He goes, hey, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but be wise. Don't live with just knowledge in your head. Develop a sense of deep understanding how significant your lifestyle is. He says, making the most of every, time, every opportunity. Time, time is short. And then he says, because the days are evil. There's a lot of other things that want to influence how you live, how you walk, how you make decisions, and how you do that. So this first idea is be very careful how you live. Walk with a sense of understanding. Um, oftentimes when we seek God's will, it's like at major points in our life. Like, who should I marry, for example? Lord, I want... And oftentimes, the Lord is a little bit like, well, who do you want to marry? Or what kind of a career uh, should I go for? Uh, I know many of our high school students, our high school seniors are about to graduate. One of the worst things you can ask a high school senior is, what do you want to be? Who do you want to become? It's like, I don't know. And God often says, well, what would you like to do? Or perhaps, how do I spend my retirement years? What should I do with my... God's like, he cares far more about the day-to-day -day decisions in life that we live. Uh, walking with Christ is far more of a long obedience in the same direction. Paul says, be careful. And so what I've done is I have five questions for all of us to kind of do some evaluation. These are all questions built out of the theology that Paul has been giving us in the book of Ephesians. And with each question, I want you to ask yourself, 
uh, on a scale of one to five, how's my spiritual maturity doing? Where am I at? Because the, the book of Ephesians is meant to help us grow up spiritually as a local church. Uh, one, let's say one is like, yeah, I'm, an, I'm infantile there. I, I, don't, I don't get it yet. I don't do that. Uh, five would be maybe like, oh, I, I came to grips with that truth or that reality a long time ago. Um, and I want you to know that this is not um, an attempt to shame anyone for where they're at spiritually. This is an opportunity for all of us to kind of go, I think this is where I am. The bigger question when we walk through these is, okay, this is where I'm at. Where do I really want to be? Where do I want to be? So I've got five kind of evaluation questions because Paul's like, be careful. So these questions give us an opportunity to kind of evaluate that. You ready? Question number one. I make my decisions, I live uh, based on my understanding that my core identity flows from having been chosen by the Father. Before the beginning of time, He chose to adopt me into His family as His beloved child and to destine me for being in His family forever. The Father, we're talking about the Trinity again today, Uh, I choose to say that my core identity flows out of the fact that I have been loved and redeemed and forgiven by Jesus Christ. Uh, My identity flows from a sense that uh, because of what the Father and the Son have done for me, the Spirit comes along and seals me or indwells me and seeks to empower me and influence me and that I've been sealed for eternity. I mean, I belong to God, my identity. Okay? That's how I make decisions. On a scale of one to five, one is like, yeah, I never think about that. I I don't know who I am, or I build my identity around something else, some other good thing. Or five is like, oh yeah, (laughs) I can't believe what he's done for me. I can't believe how he's blessed me with every spiritual blessing. And so I live with a sense of trajectory to please him. One to five, how you doing? Question number two. I clearly understand, I understand this. That any attempt to gain access to God through my behavior is totally futile. I clearly understand that trying to be good enough will never get me to God. And that it just doesn't work. It's pointless and vain, futile. Scale one to five. One being like, what? I've been trying to be good so that I could get to God. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to make sure the good things outweigh the bad things, and that's a one. It's like, yeah, that's called religion. That's not called following Jesus. On a scale of one to f- on a five, it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> I know that he has poured nothing but grace and mercy out on me, and that it's not because of anything that I've done. He just loves me. Where are you at? Scale of one to five. Question number three. I understand and I look to the person of Jesus as he's revealed in the text. I look to Jesus as my primary model or example on how to live well. I look to Jesus in terms of trying to figure out how do I relate well to my spouse if I'm married, or my employer, my employees. How do, I, how do I use Jesus as my primary example on interacting with other people? One is like, really? <laughs> you think I could ever you know, become like Jesus kind of a thing? It's like, really? And number five would be, oh yeah. Oh man, as I've sought to adopt his values, his attitude in my life, it has changed everything. Where are you at? Scale of one to five. Uh, number four. Uh, this moves now from kind of an individuality kind of thing to the local church. And 
this little letter in Ephesians is all about the local church. And so these questions come out of the theology that Paul has given us about God's family and belonging to my local church. Number four, I understand that being a citizen, my citizenship, as Paul put it, he also used the term metaphor family, and he also used the metaphor temple. We together as a church family are the dwelling place of God. We're his family, but my citizenship of heaven assumes belonging to and serving in and through my church family as a primary concern for God. My, I understand as a citizen of heaven that really the local church and my place is, is a primary concern for God, for my life, will of my life. And finally, number five, how you doing? Make sense? Can, are they understandable? All right, number five. I understand that participating in Sunday worship, uh, the gathering of the people, you know, Resurrection Day, Sunday worship, um, it, and the relationships with my church family are core commitment, are core for me to actually grow and mature as a follower of Jesus. Uh, the idea of the weekly family meal, all coming out of the book of Ephesians, one through five, keeping a mental score, do you have a little bit of a sense where you might be in your maturity level? Again, I'm going to circle back and say, there is no shame in being on the journey. So if you're like, Randy, I wandered in here feeling an urge that I needed to go to church, and my, I just felt like I should do this, and I... You're right where you're supposed to be. And God loves you, and he wants you to be here. This isn't like, oh, man, you're doing bad. He just wants you to be on the journey. How are we doing as a church? By the way, every church, every good church has people all along the spectrum. Every good church is a mess. People's, I mean, it's just that we're all, all a work in progress. It might take me two years to get from two to three on this idea that I belong to a local family, or it might, whatever it might be. So there's no shame in any of that. My question to you isn't so much where you're at, but where do you want to be in that? And what Paul is saying is be very careful. Be very careful because this is the Lord's will as it has been revealed in the book of Ephesians. He says, be careful, it's dangerous out there. It's very dangerous. There are a lot of forces at work to influence your lifestyle. And if you listen to them, most of them, it says here, make the most of your time, the days are evil. He said, you'll botch up your life. It'll become a mess. And so Paul, in this first point, he's saying, be careful. Watch your step. Um, it's very important how you do that. He says, make the most of your opportunity. Loves the local church. There's a sense of urgency. Time will go under the bridge. It'll happen. I remember when I was 20, 60, it just seemed like a few weeks ago. I, I remember changing his diapers a few weeks ago. It just goes by so quick, quickly. So first point, really critical. Watch out. Be reflective of how you live. Be wise. Apply your, your knowledge that you know about God to your life. He says it's critical for you. It's absolutely critical. Uh, it does a person no good to know stuff and then not to live it out. Second thing Paul says is, uh, under, first of all, be careful, be wise. Secondly, and walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Uh, verse 17 says uh, this, just the next verse. Therefore, he says, again, on the wisdom thing, don't be foolish. Don't be a fool. Uh, Jesus told a story about a foolish man who built his mansion on the beach. He had all kinds of stuff. He had everything. And he built it right on the sand on the beach. And when the tide came in and everything happened, the house went away. 
Jesus says, don't be a fool. Build your house on a rock, on truth, right from the text on who Christ is. He says, don't be a foolish person, but understand what the Lord's will or the Lord's desire for you or the Lord's plan for your life, the way he's wired you to be. Um, Those questions outline God's will for you. Interestingly, I uh, read a few articles this last week. Uh, this is about church attendance because I think the book of Ephesians clearly talks about the importance of being deeply engaged relationally with your church family. Um, this is what culture is learning about church attendance and about church cult, Christian culture. Um, this is, comes from uh, as, uh, Christianity Today. As Christianity continues to decline in the West, one of the things we've talked about in this series is how the local church is in a crisis across the country. We've talked about not having a political problem as a country, but a spiritual problem as a country. Listen, so uh, as church uh, Christianity continues to decline in the West, the broader world, the outside world, the non-Christian world, has begun to notice that something's missing. The loss of Christian culture leaves us all worse off. This is a non-Christian person going, man, the church really helped us. And that there's benefits about being a Christian and living in a Christian society. Combined study from uh, Harvard scholar Tyler, somebody, Vander Weil, and Brad Wilcox. The benefits of participating in religious services find that leads to improved mental health, these aren't Christians. Improved mental health, physical health, happiness, and a sense of meaning. Statistically, going to church regularly will help you flourish as a human being as if like, wow, God actually kind of understands how we're wired and how we function. Interestingly, for married couples, this is really fascinating. Regular church attendance even correlates with a more satisfying sex life. Hey, and, and Todd, I love it because you're right there every week, man. I love it. Uh, there's benefits, benefits for you. What in the world is that kind of a statistic about? How can being a part of my church family impact my sexuality? Maybe God actually knows what he's doing. Maybe as I flourish in community, uh, there's a mental health benefit because God knows we need there are all these things. It's like holistically, we're just better off. Perhaps married couples who are seeking to do things the way God has designed it to happen just end up happier marriages. Interesting. Interesting. Be careful, he says. Be careful how you live. The days are evil. Understand what the Lord's will is with re- relationship to your church and life and be- seeing Jesus as your model for decision making. And, and he says, walk in the spirit. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And then he goes on and says, I want you to be intoxicated with God. Listen, do not get drunk on wine, with, which leads to a botched up life. Debauchery. There's a word. When is the last time you used the word debauchery? <laughs> I want to I I see if I can help you include the concept of debauchery in your vocabulary this morning. Uh, instead, he says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. But instead, here it is, be under the influence, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, Paul's basically saying, don't, don't get intoxicated with mind-altering things. That's a bigger principle. He uses alcohol as an example. Uh, if I drink too much and I get stone drunk, and w- what happens? I mean, I, I end up making all kinds of decisions that end up leading to debauchery. Or I'm going to say debauchery comes actually from a French word, which means to debauch or to botch up your life. Um, 
So alcohol, we all know that. We see the destruction of alcohol. I had a gentleman after first gathering this morning, he told me, he goes, do you realize alcohol was a part of church life prior to prohibition? But what happened was at all the church events, the men would get drunk. And so they politically decided to outlaw alcohol. And so now prohibition, and since prohibition is off and gone, um, it's now moms at home who are drinking a ton. Uh, Wyoming is a drinking culture. It's an alcohol culture. It's very dangerous. Um, I have supervised young pastors, church planters. I've been doing that a long time. And I came from a culture where for a couple pastors to sit in a pub was normal, acceptable. Um, I did see some who were in the pub too often. Hey, do you want to meet the pub? And every day they're you know, at the pub at 2, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, whatever, and having a meeting with other pastors. Here's the questions I ask on alcohol. We all know alcohol is dangerous. How much do you drink? How often do you drink? And why do you drink? How much? How come? And how often? Um, as a practice at Cody Alliance, I know many of us will enjoy a cold beer or something. As a practice at Cody Alliance, we don't provide alcohol at church events. Um, we use grape juice at the communion table. Jesus used wine. Because the last thing I'd ever loved, well, I don't want somebody who's a dry alcohol, somebody who's struggling with alcohol to come up and drink, you know. I have a friend who uh, planted a church, and they used real wine at the communion table, and they were in an urban kind of a context and somebody came in from off the street woman she sat up front and they opened up the communion tables and she uh she got up and uh, people were dipping it but she picked up the cup and she just went hmm so then she went and sat down and then she got back up <laughs> she, she said, so alcohol may or may not be your issue Paul is saying, hey, be careful what influences your mind. Be careful where that goes, what, what you get intoxicated with. Uh, because it could debauch your life. You could botch it all up. Uh, let's take uh, media, for example. Um, picture this beautiful woman in a seductive, you know, revealing outfit and uh, you know a bottle of Jack Daniels sitting there on the on the picture and and and, a, and here's what she says real men drink Jack Daniels be careful she's gonna botch up your life real women do this I mean you could take anything that's trying to be sold to you and say, I need to be able to look through this and say, what's the root motivation here? And if I give myself to this, chocolate chip cookies, I mean, can watch out. It can, it can mess you up. Food, materialism. Paul's saying, ah, don't be influenced by that. Be very, very careful how you live. He says, don't botch up your life. Don't decay. Become corrupt. Don't escape. Be careful what influences you um, along those things. So, um, there's three gauges that I want to give you. Uh, talk about evidence of being under the influence of the Holy Spirit three ideas that Paul wants to lay down to say, okay, here's what it means to be influenced by the Spirit. Before I go back to that, I just want to say, this is what me it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you become a follower of Jesus, Ephesians told us, Ephesians chapter 1, when you become a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit seals you, indwells you, guarantees your eternity. I mean, the Holy Spirit. And so you have the Spirit of God. You're sealed. You're His possession. 
He's not an add-on somehow. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means now I have access to the resources of God in the mundane choices of life every day. It can be temptation. It can be whatever. It's like, oh Lord, I need help now. And here comes help. That's what it means to keep in step or to walk in the Spirit, to be indwelt by Him. Uh, The idea is I'm eager and willing to live for Jesus because of the fullness of the Spirit. Um, And so the idea of the Holy Spirit, I'm under His influence. He's guiding my decisions. In a talk like this, the Holy Spirit may not overpower you, but what He's doing is He's saying, yep, this is true. This is what it means. How are your gauges? How are you living? Be careful. You feel that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to say, yeah, okay, I'm listening. Now I'm starting to walk and keep in step with the Spirit. Paul says, that's what you got to do. You got to be careful. There's no other way to live. You got to be careful. Know what the Lord's will is. Keep in step with the Spirit. And here's the gauges or marks. First one has to do with our worship. Second has to do with the issue of gratitude. And the third one actually has to do with the issue of submission. First one, uh, verse 19, chapter 5. Worship, singing, speaking to each other. He says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit with a sense of joy. Have you ever been in worship? It's like, oh my word, this is the best ever. That's evidence that the Spirit is walking with you. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. That's the first kind of gauge. I mean, is there a song on your heart? Is there a tune of praise and worship? The second one goes with it. Gratitude. Verse 20. um, Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the uh, gratitude is the antidote to sin. Actually, sin can be described as a lack of gratitude, ingratitude. It's like, I, I just, it's, I want it about me all the time. Gratitude, oh, I'm so grateful that Kendra has put up with me for 43 years. I really am. I look at her with a sense of awe. I'm so grateful to be a part of this church. I'm so grateful to live where I get to. I'm just grateful. God has given me, I'm so grateful for that young man on the screen. I'm so grateful for him. If he would just do it the way I would tell him to, you know, (laughs) he'd be okay. No, it's a joy. I'm so grateful. Are you? How's the great, I mean, do you have a song on your heart? Do you worship the Lord? Is there a spirit of deep, deep gratitude that kind of bubbles up out of your spirit. And the third gauge is is one uh, called submission. Submission. Uh, Verse 21. This verse, by the way, opens up the whole next chapter of this this text. This verse talks about the church being mutually submissive to each other. And submissive is for the American. See, we don't value submission. We value individualism independence, um, self-reliance, the idea of being a part of a community where we're mutually submitted. It's like, ah, that sounds suspicious. Um, the text says, submit to each other, submit to one another. Out of a fear of, or reverence for, for who Jesus is, after all he's done, kind of an idea. I want you to know that this whole posture of submission is rooted in God himself. And one of the things that we've looked at through this series is the idea of being Trinitarians. And I've got this slide I want to show you again in this moment because God himself models submission. Let me show you. God is one. There's one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit is not Jesus, or the Son, and Jesus is not the Father. All of chapter 1, the Father chose us, 
destined us, Jesus redeemed us, enfleshed, born of a virgin, hung on a cross, forgave us, and then the, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We're Trinitarian. And there's deep submission in the economy of the relationship of the, of the Trinity. For example, the Father sent the Son to redeem you and me, humanity. And the Son, He willingly came. In, in the Garden of Gethsemane, as He was about to fulfill the purpose of His arrival, He said to His dad, He said, Father, is there any other way? And Jesus said, but not my will be done, but yours. I'm going to submit to this whole thing, recognizing we're going to se- we'll be separated for the first time in eternity. The Holy Spirit uh, sent, the Holy Spirit does not draw attention to himself. The Holy Spirit really points a spotlight on the person of work of Jesus, which is why we take communion together. But I want you to see that there's a, an economy of submission and oneness and unity that is to be expressed not just in the church family, but in our homes and in our work and how we live as a rather than me, mine, selfish me. Paul says, submit to one another. This is how we live out our baptism, our identity of who we are. When I'm baptized, we we celebrate baptism and communion as two primary vehicles to identify who we are as followers of Christ. Baptism just simply means to dip, so I'm, I'm taking on the very identity of Christ in his death and in his resurrection. I'm now a new person. That's who I am, so this is how I live now. Uh, in the old days, back in the old days when war was fought with swords, there's rumors that soldiers, warriors, um, when, they were, when they gave their life to Christ... They would get baptized, but they would, they would not allow their sword hand to go underwater. So they would hold their hand out, and so they'd baptize them. But, but I'm going to control my sword hand. I'm not giving up my sword hand. No way. And, and uh, the, the overwhelming remodeling of the soul that God wants to do is he wants to say, no, I want the sword hand too. This idea of submission, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut right straight to the core of it. Uh, for, for many of us, um, isn't a sword hand. It's our finances. I've been here for three and a half years, and I barely spoke about finance. Uh, and a part of it is, as pastors have your reputation for always wanting money. I, just, I want your soul. I'll just be honest with you. I want Christ to have every piece of you. So for us, Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He's a famous, one of the best preachers there's ever been. He said, there's three conversions in a person's life. The first is his head. It's like, okay, I understand who Jesus is. I understand what he did. I get it. Yes. Then there's the conversion of the heart that says, I need him. I'm yielding my life to him. I'm all in. I can't do it myself. I'm sick and tired of this. I can't earn my way. I can't behave my way to God. I need Jesus. Head, heart. And Spurgeon says the third is the wallet. So in our culture, oftentimes a person will come to Christ and it's like, I'm just keep my wallet hand out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Everything but my wallet kind of a thing. Jesus paid the penalty for your and my sin so that we could be adopted into his forever family. He redeemed us, and he's given us the Holy Spirit to guide, to influence, to intoxicate us to guide us home. He wants everything. If you think, what's the opposite of submission? I think Satan. 
said, I don't want to submit to God anymore. I want to be God. And it's what got, got him kicked out of heaven. And so I, I bring up this issue of submission because it's a gauge of how much you have given control of your life to God. It's a, it's a gauge on how much the Spirit is leading you. Paul says in this text, as a summary, please be very careful how you live, your lifestyle. Your lifestyle isn't just about, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to beat my wife, I'm not going to do this stuff, and I'm a pretty good person. No, it's understanding what the Lord's will is, which is I'm redeemed, I'm mutually submitted, I belong to the family, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a part of a family that's on a mission in a dark, broken world. When you think of the gauges about in your own life, where are you in that? And, and the more important question, it's important to know where you're at. Leadership, self-leadership begins with honesty. The bigger question is, where do you want to be? Where, do you want to be yielded? I'm grateful for Paul because he keeps coming around on this. He says, be careful. It's dangerous out there. Let's pray. I, I tell you, Father, I, I confess that this, this is true. It's true. Everything we've talked about from your word is true. And yet in our hearts, we confess there's a, there's a seed of resistance. And as we sang this morning, wrestle with our hearts. Come wrestle with us and win. Please govern us. Lead us and guide us by your Spirit. For the sake of Jesus, in his name, amen.